ahead and get started. And we are happy to have you here. Welcome. Thank you for attending the first Enviro School webinar of the 2023-2024 school year. And today we are focusing on empowering youth through citizen and community science programs. So happy to have you here learning with us today. If you joined us for any of our past Enviro School webinars last year, you might remember that we focused on the work of Eagles Regulatory Divisions, or the six blue rectangles featured on the site here. Um, in those ones, people were introduced to staff who work in our programs and what they do to meet our mission of protecting the environment and public health. And if you're interested in any of those recordings, you can view them on our YouTube channel. Uh, this year, we are focusing instead on our the work of our executive offices. These are our high level strategy and policy focused offices that work on advancing key priorities in the department um, and key priorities of the state of Michigan to protect the environment and public health. And you might say, I don't see an office of community science in there, but it actually fits really well into several of these offices as there's a lot that you can do to advance research around climate change and Great Lakes issues and water quality and environmental justice through community science research. So a quick teaser of what's coming up in December. We're going to talk about climate change and curriculum resources that are out there to help you teach about this in a Michigan specific way. Uh, we're going to open up some of our new Meeks curriculum around climate change uh, and look at some neat partnerships and registration is open for that if you're interested. And then in the winter, we'll open up registration for our February and our May sessions focusing on environmental justice and Great Lakes stewardship. So we hope to see you at those too. But we are here today to talk about citizen science, so let's jump in and start talking about that. So I'm going to give you a really brief overview of what citizen science is and why it's such an impactful way to engage youth in learning. And then I'm going to hand it over to a few of our Eagle staff to share some of the work that they do that includes opportunities for the public to participate. Um, and they're just a few examples of how Eagle's involved in citizen science. But we also know that there are lots of other opportunities to participate and we're just trying to get you interested and kind of get the tip of the iceberg. So the first question you might be asking is what is a citizen scientist? Uh, citizen scientists are experts in their own communities, but they generally don't do science as their quote day job. Rather, they are usually curious or concerned people who are collaborating with professional scientists in a way that advances scientific research on topics that they care about. Um, and there's a link on the slide here to an organization called SciStarter, which is one of the really great organizations that support citizen science work around the country and really around the globe. Um, and they outline four major characteristics of citizen science. So first, citizen science is open to anybody. Anybody can participate. But number two, everybody uses a common protocol. So you're collecting your data, you're sharing your data in the same way. And this is what allows number three to happen, which is when professional science scientists use that data collected to come to real conclusions and take real actions in their community. And fourth, that data that's collected from scientists and volunteers working together is widely accessible both to other scientists and to the general public. But I titled this, uh, this webinar Citizen and Community Science. So you might be wondering, what is community science? And it's really not a lot different. Uh, the fact is there's a lot of ways to talk about this kind of science. And uh, a lot of people like to use the term community science as a broader and more inclusive term to surround what we're doing in this space. So it recognizes that you don't have to be a citizen of a place or a community in order to have really deep knowledge of it or to contribute to understanding it or studying it. So community science is just a more inclusive term to use when re referring to this type of work. Um, and you might hear words like community-based or participatory research uh, used in this space as well. And those are used particularly more commonly when projects are really co-created by scientists and community members together. Citizen science can look a lot of different ways. And a lot of us, at least for me, because I came into environmental education working in water, uh, a lot of us think about water quality as a citizen science program that we engage youth in. So looking at macroinvertebrates, looking at water chemistry, and um, we'll talk about some of those types of programs today, but you can do citizen science around just about anything that you can observe in your community. So it could be invasive plants, it could be forests, it could be lakes, it could be looking at the air or even the way that our own community is made up. So, for example, I used to work on the Grand River in Grand Rapids, Michigan, before I came to Eagle, and some of the community science programs happening there are 
cool examples of how broad citizen science can be. So they have a project going on with the Grand Rapids Public Museum where they're looking at how anglers are using the river before, during, and after a restoration project. Um, and that's a really cool data set that's kind of a unique type of citizen science you might think about. Um, you can also do things like this project that I worked on when I was part of that organization where we were collecting data and input from the community on their concerns about priorities or trouble areas that might, might need attention. Um, and this is something you can do with young people using something simple like Google Maps or Google Earth or ArcGIS. So community science can look a lot of different ways um, and it can involve collecting data on scientific and ecosystem communities, but it can also include simply doing some community asset mapping of your own community as well. But why do it? Why engage youth? Well, the research is out there and it gives us lots of great reasons. First, it's really well documented that citizen science activities increase student interest. Uh, and because of the wide range of knowledge and skills needed to perform the activities, it also diversifies the type of knowledge that students gain through an activity. Um, in part, because it is such a hands-on activity, citizen science also tends to increase student participation in learning and really improve their uh, self-efficacy as they learn to master new skills and how to communicate with people. That increased engagement is often tied to higher academic achievement, greater interest in STEM topics, sometimes even interest or pursuing STEM careers. And in addition to all of that, researching and acting on environmental issues often improves people's attitudes towards the environment and that along with their knowledge can give them the opportunity to take positive environmental behavior. So when that knowledge is embedded with action the way that it is in citizen science, um, it's often associated with changes in environmental action and environmental behavior, which has a real conservation outcome, which is really cool. And I told you that the research is there. Uh, it's cited on the previous slide. Here's the research. Don't worry too much about this. You'll get a copy of it later. I just wanted you to know that I did look at it. So that's the research. So we know that it's important. We know we know why it's important, but how does citizen science accomplish these gains in knowledge, skills, and actions? And a large part of that is because citizen science really emphasizes environmental literacy and community engagement. And some of the folks on the call, I see some names who I know are really familiar with environmental literacy. Some of you maybe aren't. An environmentally literate person is someone who uh, on their own, but also together with others, is able to make informed decisions about the environment, is willing to act on their decisions uh, in order to improve the well-being of other people, other societies, the global environment, and that they also participate in civic engagement and civic life. So it's not just knowledge and skill, it's not just knowledge, but it's also skills and action. And so I want to, before I turn it over to my co-presenters, I'm just going to let you know, here's a few ways that citizen science really helps you as an educator implement some of the environmental education strategies that we know are effective. And this is based on um, experience, but also some of the work of some great environmental education and civic engagement researchers. So one of the strategies for environmental education that's really effective is that it's personally relevant and engaging. And citizen science offers us a really unique opportunity to make learning culturally responsive to our students um, as it connects the communities and the locations and the practices and the places that are interesting to students and to their families and their communities. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to attend to equity by looking at how issues of justice connect with the phenomenon that are being studied in their own community, in their own backyard. And in terms of being relevant and engaging young people and really people of any age remember what they do, what they got their hands on and how they felt while they were doing it. And citizen science is really a powerful way to engage people in that hands on action. Effective environmental education also builds problem solving skills. It incorporates engineering design, which again, citizen science is really uniquely equipped to do because young people are identifying local phenomenon of interest that they can study, and that helps them learn about what issues are of concern in their area, who are the people who are working on the issues, and what are they doing, and start to design some actual solutions to things that they find of concern. And that gives opportunities to embed a stewardship or a service project, which is where we get those conservation outcomes from citizen and community science. Uh, that also really helps, you know, doing, learning by doing really helps cement some of that knowledge and skills that are being gained. Uh, and finally, one of the really effective environmental education activities is to connect to professional scientists. And this is what citizen science really in, 
excels at is connecting young people, connecting the public with people who spend their whole life studying and researching and doing science. And that gives them the ability to learn how to address complex environmental issues and broaden their understanding of what it means to work in the sustainability realm. So when they contribute to research and to action and they, when they learn new skills through technology and data analysis, they're really building uh, self-efficacy and confidence that young people then can take with them into their academic and their personal uh, goals later in life and set them on the pathway towards being a really engaged part of their community, but also potentially having a really fulfilling career. So that's that's my intro. That's what citizen science is, what impacts it has on learning, how it achieves those improvements on learning. But I want to give some time for my co-presenters here to talk about what that looks like in practice. So we have a couple Eagle staff with us today who are here to talk about water and air quality and what those programs look like. And then I'll share a little bit about some invasive species programs at the state. Um, and there's more options than just these, but they're just meant to get you started so that you can start working on empowering the next generation of stewards as well. So I'm going to start with one of our most common citizen science activities, which is looking at water quality. And I'm going to invite Tamara Lipsy from Eagles Water Resource Division here to talk about that with us now. So Tamara, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okie dokie. Mm -hmm. How's that look? That looks good, thanks. All right. Hi everyone, my name is Tamara Lipsy and I'm an aquatic biologist with Eagle. Um, I've been with uh, the department for 20 years, but in the past three years, I've taken on a new role and that has to do with my core. So my core stands for Michigan Clean Water Corps. Um, it is our state's volunteer water quality monitoring programs. It's funded through state general funds through EGLE. And then we have a partnership with Michigan State University, Huron River Watershed Council, and Michigan Lakes and Streams Association to help uh, us administer the programs. The organization of my core is has three things underneath its umbrella. We have a cooperative lakes monitoring program. We have a volunteer stream monitoring program, and then we also have a volunteer stream cleanup program. So the focus of my core um, is to collect high quality data. MyCor was created through an executive order to assist EGLE in collecting water quality data that can be used for resource management and protection. So we really do use the data, and in order to use the data, we need to make sure it's high quality. So our focus is to educate volunteers about water quality and to provide a lot of training and technical assistance that they need to collect that high quality data. And we have a lot of volunteers collecting data. Um, on the left is an image of all of the lakes that were enrolled in my core in 2023. It's about 300 lakes. And on the right is the number of stream sampling locations that were sampled at least once between May of 2018 and September of 2023. And um, those those sites are divided up, up among about 30 to 35 organizations. So all of the data that's been collected at these sites are entered into a database that is available online to the public. Anyone can view the data um, and people enter their data right online. Um, I look at this data almost on a daily basis. Um, you can search by many parameters. You can search by streams or lakes, and then you can narrow it down based on your county or maybe a lake name. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about our Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program, and sometimes we refer to it as CLMP. Um, 
Volunteers can choose from several parameters that measure productivity. I don't have time to go into them today, um, but they're listed here. And they could also look at plant communities in their lake, including invasive species, or they can look at shoreline habitat health. But since sampling lakes requires a bow, it's not usually something that would be really accessible for teachers to take their students out to do. However, since we have more than 300 volunteers or 300 lakes participating in the program, there is a good chance that there's a volunteer near your school and they may be willing to mentor a student over the summer. They sample May through September or they might be willing to come to your classroom to talk about the monitoring that they do. And if this is something you think you would be interested, um, I encourage you to please reach out to me. Another option for educators might be to use our database for classroom exercises, um, or you might be able to use the individual lake reports that we produce for any lake that participates in the program that year. So all of these lake reports are available and they're sorted by county. Uh, so students could choose a lake in Michigan that they're most interested in and then use the reports to learn about the productivity of a lake. Um, they could also recreate the graphs in the reports using data directly pulled from the database. And all the reports um, can be found online. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, the MyCore volunteer stream grant programs. One is a monitoring program and one is a cleanup program. And both of them, um, we do give out grants annually um, for these programs. So the first is the volunteer stream monitoring. Um, we give them out to generally watershed groups um, to support volunteer stream monitoring programs. So we might give it out to a conservation district or um, some type of other state or county entity. And then they will get trained and then have their own sampling events with volunteers from the community. Uh, this program focuses on collecting macroinvertebrate and stream habitat data, which includes um, habitat in the stream and then along the edge of the stream. Any group would welcome student and teacher participation on collection days in the spring and the fall. They um, sample once in the spring, usually May or sometimes June if it's further up north and in October. And all of our active groups are listed on our website. I want to step back and make sure everyone knows what macroinvertebrates are and why we look at them. They are organisms without backbones and you can see them with the naked eye. And they can be indicators of water quality because they live in a stream throughout the year versus if you just take a water sample, you're only seeing what's in the water right then. Um, and some types of macroinvertebrates are more or less sensitive to pollution. So once you look at them, identify them, it, it can tell you a little bit about the water quality. And they're also really important uh, food for fish. So I have used the concepts behind our stream macroinvertebrate monitoring program in classrooms with both my boys. Um, my youngest son is on the right. I've done presentations in their classes from preschool through sixth grade. Um, high school and middle school lessons are also possible. I just haven't had the opportunity to do that yet in my son's school. So I've adapted the stream monitoring concept in two ways. The first is to collect bugs from a local stream or river the day prior and then keep them alive overnight using buckets and a bubbler. Um, like the ones you would use for aquariums. And then the morning of the presentation, I prep some trays full of the bugs and then I give a 20 minute presentation in the classroom on the importance of macroinvertebrates as indicators of water quality. And then about 40 minutes are spent outside looking at the bugs. And since a couple of the schools 
that my kids have gone to have streams near them, I could also take smaller groups down to the stream actually, and they can see how I collected the bugs. And we can talk more about the stream riparian area and how runoff might impact streams. The second way I've done it, done it and this is um, especially with younger people, is um, our younger students, is to collect the bugs the day prior, but then everything I do is in the classroom. So I give a presentation and then I put out trays of the organisms for kids to look at. And then depending on the age group, um, if you're doing this with older students, you might be able to actually have students identify organisms and fill out the data sheet that would actually be used by volunteers doing stream surveys. And then for older kids, if there's additional class time, students could also look at the data that's in our database and compare it to what they collected. So just to finish up, one other program that I wanted to talk about is our volunteer stream cleanup grant program. Grantees have to be affiliate, affiliated with a local unit of government. Um, but two ways you could get involved is we have several groups who apply for funds every year. And so I know there's continuous groups that go out every year and they would welcome help at any time. Or you could organize one of your own with students um, by approaching maybe your local municipality. Often municipalities are willing to partner with someone if they're willing to organize it. And uh, this student here shown in this picture is from Dexter Township. And there were two students who were concerned about all the trash in the Huron River near where they lived. So they partnered with their parents and Dexter Township and received a grant to clean up part of the Huron River and it was done with all high school students. So that's all the time I have today, but um, if any of this tweaked your interest, be sure to reach out to me and I can discuss the programs in more detail, um, send you links to our program and answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Tamara. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, feel free to reach out. I'll make sure that everybody's contact information is in the follow up uh, email that you'll all receive. If you're interested in learning more about my core, I also put that in the chat. Uh, so I want to introduce our next uh, Eagle speaker is Caitlin DeVries. Caitlin is the outreach liaison for our air quality division. And while a lot of us have, who are environmental educators have probably thought about doing water quality monitoring, not as many people have thought about doing air quality monitoring. And especially all the wildfire smoke this past spring, um, I've started to hear from a lot more students and educators who are interested in learning about air quality. So Caitlin's gonna tell us a little bit more about what you can do to learn about air in your community and how you can be involved in some really cool community science efforts around air quality. So Caitlin, go ahead and take it away. Great, thanks Eileen. Can you see my screen okay? Yep, it looks great. Perfect. So thanks so much Eileen for having me today. Um, definitely looking forward to talking to you guys. I know air quality is something that we often just step outside, take a breath of fresh air and think everything's cool because you, you can't really see it, right? But up until this last summer where we were all impacted by those wildfire smokes, I know that's something that has come to the forefront of a lot of people's minds. So definitely um, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you guys today. So as Eileen said, um, my name is Caitlin DeVries and I'm the Air Quality Outreach Specialist for our Environmental Support Division. So what that means is I do a lot of our um, community engagement, um, outreach for handouts um, related to air quality, um, both for citizens and for industry and kind of facilitate some of that. Uh, prior to moving into this role, I was an inspector out of our Grand Rapids district office for eight years. So what that meant is I went into industry and made sure that they were complying with their permits. So before we kind of dig into how you guys can get involved with the air quality division, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what does the air quality division do. Okay, so the air quality division does a wide variety of things. So we write and issue air permits for the industrial sector. Um, we conduct air emission 
inspections at sources of air emissions. We monitor the quality of air through the use of a network of monitors that we have throughout the states. Um, that also includes sensors. Um, we do emission control strategy planning, um, meeting, do we make plans for how the state in general can meet the national ambient air quality standards set forth by the EPA, so that it's protective of public health. Um, and we also respond to citizen complaints and concerns. So for this presentation, I'm primarily going to discuss the ways that you can connect with the Air Quality Division and how we work directly with the community um, and citizens rather than industry. But I'm definitely open to answering any questions that anybody may have on anything else that I don't touch upon in more detail. So as I kind of alluded to, you know, how do we see what the air quality is around me? Um, hopefully it's not colored because that means it's probably not great, um, which we may have experienced this summer, at least I did where I live um, from the wildfire smoke. So how do you know what it is rather than just walking outside and taking a look? So we have a lot of on our website as to what the air quality is in your specific area. Um, we've got information on our website about our air quality forecast, where our meteorologists will do a forecast for the air quality in your area. They will send out any alerts if the air is unhealthy for any specific um, people, uh, like sensitive groups, if you've got asthma, um, the elderly, those type of people, they will create the air quality forecasts and you can access those through our website. You can also get real-time air quality information direct from all of our network of monitoring stations and sensors throughout the state. So you can see where the closest one is to your community and see what we're monitoring there, as well as the status of the, the monitors. Um, lastly, you can also sign up for notifications through our EnviroFlash system. Um, EnviroFlash, which I'll talk about more in a minute, um, will sign you up for alerts directly to your smartphone. So moving more into our website on where you can find some data, we've got an interactive web page using ArcGIS, um, who doesn't like maps, um, that you, if you have students, um, that they can go in there and zoom in and look directly at where all of our monitors are located throughout the state. These monitors are kept, um, this web page is kept very up to date with all of our monitoring information um, and will soon include two additional monitoring monitors that we are going to be deploying, one in the Grand Rapids area and one in the Detroit area. Um, so stay tuned for an update when those go online hopefully sometime probably in early 2024. Um, you can also on, a, on this web page find our most recent annual air quality report as well as historical air quality reports for the past few years. So in these air quality reports gives you trends and data from all of the networks of our monitoring station as to what does the air look like? What is the, what is the trends looking like for something like particulate matter or ozone in your area to see is the air getting healthier? Is the air getting worse? Is it kind of just staying the same? Um, this will give you a lot of good detail on the specifics around the state. Um, we also um, have an opportunity in, in there to, for you to comment on our network plans. So if you think we should have a monitor in an area we don't, um, we do allow an opportunity for the public to make comments on there as to why we should um, do something different. I'll talk a little bit more in the next few slides on how you can get involved. So here's a look at um, a couple of our monitoring stations. Um, depending on what is getting monitored at those different locations, the the stations will look different. Um, obviously, the one on the right is a little bit smaller, um, monitoring for, 
for less pollutants than the one on the left. Um, but we do measure for a bunch of different pollutants, including VOCs, volatile organic compounds, particulate matter, lead, ozone, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, um, and other variety of metals. Um, it really just depends on the location of the monitor on what we're monitoring. Um, the Air Quality Division uses the measurements taken from those monitors to identify what I was talking about in our annual reports um, for trends um, to ensure that we're meeting those air quality standards to be protective of human health and also to support in that air pollution forecasting that I was talking about that our meteorologists do. So in addition to those big bulky monitors, um, we also employ um, sensors. So an example of a sensor is shown there on the right hand side of your screen. Um, sensors also collect um, data on pollution for a particular pollutant, but they and they do have some limitations just because they're much smaller um, and they don't have the ability necessarily to collect as comprehensive of a data set for the different pollutants that we have. Um, other limitations might be a bias towards something just because they're not as robust as those big monitors. Um, they could over or underestimate things. So we do like to caveat that with that there are some limitations to sensor data. Um, sensors are, of, are a lot less expensive um, and they're portable and easier to, to use in most cases. And they do allow for citizens such as yourself to get more information on the air quality that's a lot more specific to you because you can put one of these up on your deck or on a light lamp post in your neighborhood. Um, they're a lot easier to get installed than one of our big monitors. Um, EPA has a lot of really good information on their website in terms of sensor data and networks that they have. We to those on our website as well um, for what sensors can do. So here are some of those links that I was talking about um, for resources for sensors and how to access the information to see what the air quality is in your neighborhood. Um, so all of those are listed on the left hand side. It will give you a bunch of different information um, depending on what you're looking for. So the purple air um, and just air I will talk about in more specific. Um, Open map will map some of that um, data out for you. And the fire and smoke map available on EPA's air now. Um, it's definitely a tool that got used a lot this summer when we were talking about all of those Canadian wildfires, where those fires were, and how the weather patterns would shift the smoke to be impactful either in Michigan or in any of the other states, depending on the wind direction. Because um, as we know, and one thing that's really cool about air quality is that we know that uh, the weather plays a role. So something that you could do with some students is take a look at the wildfire map and the wind direction and do some predictions as to, is this gonna be a good day to play outside or is this gonna be a not so good day to play outside depending on the wind direction and the movement of of the airflow based on the meteorological and the weather data. Um, so one kind of thing to, to kind of partner those two different areas of science together. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about a couple of these here. So how can you get involved in really looking at this data and how it impacts you? So first off, I wanted to talk about the air quality index. Um, this is something that has been really kind of pushed to the forefront of a lot of people's minds due to those wild, the wildfire events. Um, the air quality index has been around for a long time and does give you basic information for ozone as well as part, particle pollution. 
Um, and it's a really clever way for that EPA created to communicate the air quality to the public. Um, it's easy to use and interpret because of the bright colors. So, you know, green means good, maroon, ooh, not very good. Um, it also gives you a description there as to who the air may be unhealthy for so that you can make a, make a good decision on whether or not you should be sending your students outside or not sending your students outside for that soccer game or baseball game. Um, or as we move into, well, we're moving into the colder season, so maybe they won't want to play outside as much. But definitely um, as we get into nicer weather and experiencing the events that we had. So particulate matter and, as I mentioned, and ground level ozone are the primary pollutants that we have. And um, it's important to note that the, the air quality index, so the values listed there in the third column, um, are a snapshot of the current health levels for the air and are not the same as the measurements that we get from our continuous monitors. If you're comparing the data that you get from our monitoring uh, network versus what the air quality index says. So another cool attribute for the air quality index is that you can access it through your smartphone. Um, what, there's a lot of kids these days have smartphones, whether you want them to or not. Um, but there, a lot of the weather apps are integrated with the air quality index directly into them. So another cool thing to, to if you want to integrate, if they are going to look at their phone, at least have them look at something that's a little bit educational. Um, so this air quality index is also similar to EPA's flag program. Um, EPA created the flag program um, specifically for schools so that you can, the schools can put up a flag that matches the same color as the air quality index. So that way if a parent um, is dropping their child off at school or um, an older student is driving in and they see that it's a green flag, you know that's good air quality day. It's nice and easy, quick to look at, um, and supports um, knowing what the air quality is outdoors at your school. So moving along, um, this is a, another option that you can use, and it's a little bit more up and coming and really specific here to Michigan. Um, this is Just Air, and they have um, a website that you can access as well as an app that will display real-time air quality information in a specific local region. So they have uh, monitoring networks in the Grand Rapids, Dearborn, Detroit, um, spending, expanding into other areas of Wayne County too, as well as Kalamazoo. Um, so I live in the Grand Rapids area. Um, so I have a screenshot here of their monitoring network for the 49507 area code, um, which is on the south side of Grand Rapids. So it gives you the green dots there, um, matching the air quality index over on the bottom corner. And you can see specifically where those monitoring um, sensors are, and it's important to note that those are sensors. Um, the Air Quality Division has worked with Just Air before, and we have co-located our sensors with theirs in the past for data verification purposes. So it's another thing if you've got some students who um, maybe are more the high school range that like to look at data, um, you can kind of compare and contrast some of those trends when um, you've got sensor data that might be ours or other sensors in the same area to do a comparison. So the last program I want to touch on is Purple Air. Um, Purple Air is a national sensor network um, that has sensors all throughout the country. And similar to what Just Air had, um, they've got all of the dots listed out there and for people who have the, the sensors located, um, some of them are at their homes, um, some of them are located just in the community. Um, uh, the Air Quality Division does employ some of these purple air sensors as well, and we have lent them out to communities to do some of their own monitoring. Um, it's something that, um, it's a network of sensors that the Air Quality Division definitely utilizes. 
Um, one thing for the purple air is that if you want one, you could purchase them. Um, they're about um, roughly starting around the $200 region. So um, a little bit more expensive, but definitely a lot less expensive than um, one of our monitoring stations. Um, they're easy to install and they do provide the real time uh, information for the air quality in your neighborhood. Um, and they also have an app that you can access too if you want to just check it from your phone. So with Purple Air, um, if you click on one of their circles, um, you can see the 10 minute average uh, for this sensor is tracking particulate matter size 2.5 microns and less, which is the really, really tiny um, particles that you can't see, you don't even know that are going to go really down deep in your lungs. Um, and it'll give you some trend data. So I clicked on this one um, just so you can see the information that they give. So they have got the week long trend. Um, this one in particular, it gives you a location if the person that person or um, organization that has one of these sensors puts in a location. You can see this one is located at the LMCU ballpark, which is where the West Michigan Whitecaps play. Um, so you can see that it's green, nice, good air quality today as of one o'clock when I pulled this, this screen grab. Um, important to know too, that these sensors um, are limited and only tracking um, a very small subset of pollutants. So it's not gonna be as comprehensive as the big monitoring stations. So how else can you get involved with the air quality division and the air quality in your area. So the air quality division holds public participation really, really important. Um, we have a lot of comment periods um, for our permitting actions and our enforcement actions. So um, the, we value the input and surrounding those pieces of, um, of our process. So you can access all of our public documents for permits. Um, so you can see what the industry down the road from you or at, around in your community, if they've got a permit through us, if it's out for comment, you can see all of the fact sheets related to that. Otherwise we do have all of their permits always posted to our website. Um, we also often have comment periods for our planning, uh, for instance, for any attainment changes. So attainment, means it's meeting the ambient air quality standards um, for things such as ozone. Ozone is a known pollutant that um, a lot of states struggle with making sure that we're in attainment for um, just the way that ground level ozone is formed. So um, Southwest, South or West Michigan and Southeast Michigan, um, for instance, both have recently had actions related to ozone in terms of planning for um, how the state is going to handle that. Um, and as well as what I previously mentioned, um, you can sign up on our website for EnviroFlash and that will send air quality related messaging directly to your phone. So when you wake up in the morning, getting the kids ready for school, you can look on your phone and see if there's an air quality action day and know whether or not you should plan your day differently not send the kids out for soccer practice or those type of things. And what I already mentioned is the flag program. So if you're a teacher, that might be something that you want to look forward to. They, I know at least all the schools that I've been to have a flagpole or somewhere that you can hang a flag. So another good tool for your school to get involved. So that is all of the in the stuff I have planned, Eileen. Here's my contact information as well, and happy to turn it back over to you. Yeah, thanks, Caitlin. That was great. And just to note, we get a lot of non-formal educators on these calls too. So if you work at like a nature center or a museum or a library, those are also great places for air quality sensors or for the flag program. Uh, so definitely check those out. So thank you, Caitlin, appreciate it. Um, and Tamara, you too, it was really cool to hear about the air and the water programs. And 
I want to acknowledge that in the uh, outline for this presentation, I did mention that we would talk about invasive species management as well. So I want to give you one more little taste of another thing you can talk about when it comes to citizen science with invasive species. And then I will give us some final information to wrap us up and move us into questions. So um, when it comes to invasive species and citizen science, there's two really important partnerships in the state. And I saw a lot of folks registered from conservation districts, and I want to just note that they are really amazing partners when it comes to working on citizen science activities around things like invasive species and water quality and sustainability. So definitely hang out with them if you haven't already. And if you're a conservation district person looking to get connected with a school, feel free to reach out and I'm happy to help make those connections too. So with invasive species, we have two really important partnerships. One is the Michigan Invasive Species Partnership, which is a collaboration between state agencies to promote identification and education around invasives. Uh, those, that program also gives out funding to support management and also education and awareness programs. So there's some cool programs funded through that. Um, and as far as citizen science, a lot of that related to invasive species happens through the Midwest Invasive Species Network, or you might hear it called MISIN. And MISIN allows researchers, uh, scientists, technicians, folks working in the field, and even the general public to make observations of invasive species that they find when they're out. And you can see on this dashboard, there's a ton of observations in Michigan. And you can see on this uh, observations by verification uh, that about 25%, 23%, about a quarter are from the general public. So citizen scientists are helping us make these observations. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. Uh, not only can youth programs contribute to MISIN if they want to when they're looking for invasives in their communities, they can also use the data from this source for education. So, for example, I've pulled up the MISIN map of Japanese knotweed, and this is something that we've incorporated into some of the activities and the updated version of the Ecosystems and Biodiversity Unit in our state environmental education curriculum, the MEEKS curriculum. Uh, so you could do this with a bunch of different uh, uh, types of invasive species. We just chose Japanese knotweed. You can you can flip them in there. Um, if you want to learn more about the curriculum, we have trainings happening through the end of November. So I'll drop the link to that in the chat if you want to attend one of those. But those full lessons will be online really soon too, and you can adapt them. And we love it when you adapt them to your own circumstances as well. Uh, you can also learn by watching real-time invasions of new invaders like the spotted lanternfly. That's what's on the map here. This is uh, only one confirmed location in Michigan so far, but really interesting because it uses another invasive species, the Tree of Heaven, as its primary habitat. Uh, and our statewide messaging about this invader explicitly identifies reporting, which really is citizen science, as a key tool to prevention. Uh, there was a really neat Detroit Free Press article about the lantern fly that I'll share with you afterwards, in which MDAR talked about um, an alert public as being the most valuable tool. So I just want to again remind you that there is a real world impact to the work that citizen scientists do. Uh, so the work that we do with youth and even adults in this space is really important to statewide management and conservation outcomes for these these different areas that we're working in. Um, other opportunities to identify and report invasives are out there. There's the cool eyes on the forest program where you can look at sentinel trees and look for invaders like the Asian longhorn beetle or the hemlock woolly adulgid. Uh, Tamara talked about the MyCore program uh, and as part of the uh, Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program, there's an exotic aquatic plant watch, and I've worked with some schools who've partnered with lake associations to help perform outreach and education on stopping the spread of aquatic invasives, so that's a cool opportunity. And then if you work with older youth or even just the general public, the My Paddle Stewards Program provides a really neat way to mesh recreation with citizen scientists where you're learning how to identify invasive species as you're just out on the river or on the lake enjoying yourself. Um, and programs like these can really help us stop the spread of some super nasty invaders like hydrilla, which is hot off the press, just found and confirmed in Michigan last week. Uh, and once again, state leaders are telling us that you can help uh, with early detection. It's the most important part of making sure that we can prevent spread to other places. So we've heard that was like your little taste of invasive species. I'm sorry if you want more, but I could talk about invasive species for a lot longer, but I don't want to take up all of our time. Um, so we've heard about citizen science so far today. We've heard what it is and why it works as a really good environmental ed strategy. And we've heard about some examples of programs you can participate in. But I want to like circle back to the title of this webinar, which was around empowering youth. 
And we know that citizen scientists engages youth, but how do we ensure that we move beyond just being engaged and excited about what we're doing into actually empowering them to take action? So I have a couple things I wanna share with you about that, and then I'll wrap it up for questions. And um, the first thing I wanna share is just, it's really important to give youth a voice and a choice in what activities they're engaging in with you, whether you're the teacher or the non-formal educator or the partner or the parent. Um, I know that especially in formal settings, it can be really hard. Sometimes you have to give direction on the topic, but as much as possible, allowing youth the chance to be the ones to identify the issues that are important, identify the, develop the plan to study them, to come up with research and action solutions. As much as you're able to do that, do it because that is what really empowers them and gives them a chance to act on the skills and the knowledge that they've gained from working with you. Um, it's much more than just being engaged in learning, which is also wonderful, also great, not to downplay being engaged. We really want that. Uh, but sometimes you wanna take the next step and become empowered. And so giving them that voice and that choice is a way to do that. Uh, I also just want to note that in all of this work with citizen and community science, you have a really great opportunity to attend to equity um, by studying the things that directly impact your own communities and your own well-being and your well-being of the people who are around you. And I encourage you to really take that opportunity and find ways to tie what you're learning with your students back to the health and the well-being of all people. Uh, in your community and others as well. And we're gonna talk about this in more depth in February in our environmental justice webinar. So I just wanna let you know um, that that is coming and I'll share some further ideas and tools you can use for that. But one really important thing in terms of citizen scientists is to try to avoid a deficit framework. So try to avoid talking about how we're not scientists or not experts because we, we all have expertise and we all have ways of knowing that are important. We need to be open to those multiple ways of knowing and really being open to different types of expertise that are found in our communities because the people who live in the communities are the experts on what's going on in those communities. So it's really important to recognize that and figure out how that expertise contributes to what you're studying. Um, there's a quote I really, really love by the author Robin Walkimer. She says that to be an educated person is to understand the nature of our gifts and how to give them on behalf of the world. Um, and I think that citizen science activities give us an opportunity to practice helping young people do just that in relation to what they see in their own communities. And then finally, if we're looking at really empowering, it's important to think about what level of engagement and empowerment you actually are trying to accomplish. Um, and it's okay to start small and it's okay to start with just like really wanting people to be engaged with what you're doing. So most of the citizen scientists process projects that you see are contributory, which means that scientists have designed the public the project and the public is contributing data. But when possible, if you really want to empower your audience, consider moving towards projects that are collaborative, where the public or the people working on the project are actually working alongside the scientists on more than just data contribution, but also on refinement of the program, analyzing data, sharing findings, um, or even on programs that are co-created where scientists and members of the public are working together in the entire process from identif identification of the issue to data collection to analysis to then implementing solutions. And uh, when you hear the terms, you know, uh, participatory research or community-based research, a lot of times it's, it's people working towards that co-creation realm. So that's a really important direction to go if you're really trying to empower. So you want to get started. We've talked about the what and the why. I'll share lots more resources on how in some follow-up documents I'll send you. And feel free to drop whatever you like resources in the chat too, and I'll include and share those to everybody else. Um, but first start just by like, what is outside? What's outside your window? What do you want to research? What do you want to study? Look what's there. Download iNaturalist and try doing a bio blitz with your students. Uh, browse some of these national and global resources like SciStarter or FieldScope or citizenscience.gov. There is a literal government website that says here's all the ways you can contribute to government research. So get involved in some of those things and see what's going on. And if you really want to get involved in a Michigan specific effort, you can contact me or Tamara or or Caitlin, and we'll get you connected to the right person to help help you figure out how you can contribute to some of these Michigan programs. But there's lots and lots of opportunities to get involved, either with your community group, with your students, with your scouting group, whatever it is. Um, there's lots of lots of ways that you can get involved and make a difference. And we'll send you some resources in the follow up as well. 
Um, there's some great low cost and free resources to help you learn more. Really recommend the Field Guide to Citizen Science, which was published by SciStarter. Really great entry point for youth in classrooms. Uh, you can get that for like $5 online at any number of large number of places. Uh, there's also some more detailed knowledge, especially for community groups in this Learning Through Citizen Science publication by the National Academies Press, which you can actually download as a free PDF. You don't even have to buy it. So lots of really good research and ways to support you as you get started on your, your citizen and your community science journey. But one I really want to point out is to some other resources that help you integrate citizen science data into your classroom if you're a K-12 teacher. So I've got up on the screen here a screenshot of the Invitations to Inquiry, which uses data from a program called FieldScope. And they've developed these really cool guided data inquiries that are already set up that walk through students through understanding how citizen science data is used and then encourage them to contribute to their own project. Uh, they even offer a course that for teachers where they learn how to go through all of the invitations and they actually can learn how to write their own invitation to inquiry with whatever data set you have on hand from a project you're working on. And so there's lots of cool resources out there that I'm happy to help connect you to as well. Like maybe you, your students are really interested in the MyCore data. You can pull the MyCore data from a local stream or a local lake, and you could develop an invitation to inquiry, a guided data inquiry for your students to learn more about what's around them. And then maybe they could go out and they could test water on their own after that and take action on what they've learned. So there's lots of cool resources out here and, and we could talk for hours about this and I would love to talk for hours about this. Um, offline, hopefully in person somewhere with you at a conference or something, or feel free to shoot me an email at any time. So all this work is really meant to benefit our environment, and that includes the natural world, it includes our human world, and citizen and community science is meant to engage and to empower so that we can act to improve our communities and the world around us. And I hope that you feel like you know a little bit more about citizen science and the opportunities in Michigan and feel a little bit more empowered yourself, maybe after our time together today. Um, with that, I want to just remind you again of our upcoming events. Please make sure you register for them. I want to throw my contact information up on the screen. I'll definitely send it out uh, with to the I'll send it out to you afterwards, along with the uh, notes to what we've talked about in the program today. But I would love to put my screen away now and open it up for questions. If anybody has a question that they would like to ask 